Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. It is wonderful to see you. I think you know what I'm about to say. <laughs> the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And we are about to begin one of the most exciting two weeks in the National Constitution Center's 10-year history. Next Tuesday, October 21st, we will award the 2014 Liberty Medal to Malala Yousafzai, who has just won the Nobel Peace Prize. And it is so exciting to honor her inspiring, galvanizing efforts on behalf of education and free speech for women and girls around the globe. The following Monday, October 27th, we open the new President George H.W. Bush gallery displaying one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, along with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the first public printing of the Constitution. Justice Samuel Alito will officiate, and we will be the only institution in America, aside from the National Archives, that has these rare documents of freedom in one place. Uh, the following day, we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Norwegian Constitution. And then on October 30th, we are thrilled to host two public programs on the constitutional legacy of James Madison, with federal judges coming from around the country, superb scholars, including the authors of best-selling new biographies of Madison, and federal judges and scholars of Madison, including judges Diane Wood and Kent Jordan. So please visit our website for the complete schedule of these events and listen to our podcasts and videos if you're not able to be here in person. We'll be taking audience questions, so please jot down your questions on note cards, um, and please, of course, silence your cell phones. And now, it is my tremendous pleasure to introduce uh, two esteemed guests. Uh, Ed Larson is University Professor of History, and he holds the Hugh and Hazel Darling Chair in Law at Pepperdine University. He's the author of many books and received the Pulitzer Prize in history for Summer for the Gods, The Scopes Trial, and America's Continuing Debate over Science and Religion. From 2013 to 14, he was the inaugural library fellow at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington, located on the grounds of Mount Vernon, and he is here to discuss his already acclaimed book about George Washington, which has just received a rave review in the Wall Street Journal, and I should thank our great board member, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who wrote to me as soon as Ed's book was in galleys and said, you've got to persuade him to come to the Constitution Center because this is the best new book on George Washington in a long time. And he will be interviewed by Ronnie Polineski. She has been an award-winning columnist for the Philadelphia Daily News since 1999. She offers a frontline perspective on every aspect of city life, and she did a spectacular job moderating a conversation with Senator Gillibrand last month. We are lucky to have her back and hope to welcome her many times to the stage of the National Constitution Center. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming our honored guests, Ed Larson and Ronnie Polineski. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy this hour as we discuss Professor Larson's just terrific new book. Uh, he's, this is the hard copy, and as we just heard, it just got a really wonderful review, and for very good reasons, I think, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. So I've been reading it over the past week. This is my dog-eared copy. And um, I'm just going to kind of leap right into it um, with the question of, you know, the book follows the time from 1983 to 1989. And so the question I had was, why would you focus on just 1783? <laughs> it would be the ghost of George Washington. Then. I didn't have my second double espresso this morning, forgive me. Um, but I wondered why focus just on those years. And the book actually begins with the retirement of George Washington. I don't know what's happening here. Uh, with his retirement, um, which seems like an um, odd place to start. So, Dr. Larson, if you'll tell me uh, why his retirement, the actual retirement, was so auspicious. Well, the retirement was significant because that's, it doesn't happen. Think of all the revolutionary leaders who don't retire. Uh -huh. 
Uh, that's the trend. During the revolution, the British propagandists would, would constantly say, why are you revolting against one King George, King George III, when you're only just going to get another one in George Washington, King George, right. another King George? They would point out that all popular revolutions, all military leaders, they just take power. Um, think of Oliver Cromwell, they'd say. Think of Caesar. He'll just be like that. And when you think in the future, you can think of Napoleon. You can think of after the Russian or the Chinese Revolution. Um, that's what happens. And the fact that Washington voluntarily stepped down from office. He had said during the war that he would, he would resign, um, the cessation of hostilities. When that was told, when King George asked the expatriate American painter over there, Benjamin West, what do you think Washington will do when, he, when the war is over? He says he'll retire. And he said, if he does that, he will be the greatest person in the world. And he did it. And that sent a message that still resonates to today. That is, we are under civilian rule. Our military is not just going to take over as typically happens and historically happens in offense. We're, we're going to have, as Washington would say, a government of the people. That was his yeah. phrase often. And this was something new. Right. When you look over in Europe, they were all monarchies, or they were all some sort of, t uh, of elite rule. And he was going to step down and turn the reins of power over to representatives of the people. Right. In fact, it's, it's so famous, I just should add, look at the, look, if you go to the Capitol Rotunda, the great painting in there is the painting of Washington handing in his resignation as commander-in-chief to a Pennsylvanian who was then president of Congress, Thomas Mifflin. Um, and that's the scene. That set the stage for really everything that followed to today in American politics. Mm -hmm. So, but when he retired, he did not go to some quiet retirement in Mount <laughs> Vernon, um, as you point out in his no. book. No. He was the no. opposite of a quiet, contented retiree. Tell me, yeah. tell us uh, what he did. He didn't go off and play golf right. um, down in Florida. He, um, and he still kept watch on the goings on of the country. He seemed he, to still be very he was involved. Still, well, now. Very interested, maybe, is the better To word. be honest about Washington, and Washington was very honest about himself. He was always concerned about his legacy. Even as a child, he was very ambitious, but he wasn't really ambitious for money or for power. He was really ambitious for fame, and he had a tremendous appreciation of Republican virtue. And he believed that slogan that's on the back of our $1 bill. Um, he's on the front, of course, but on the back, something new under the sun. That America could be something new under the sun. We could be a country, unlike those before them or elsewhere in the world, of uh, where the government comes from the people and goes back to the people. And he had fought a war to establish it. And during that war, he had become an American, perhaps the first American. Mm -hmm. He had fought here in Pennsylvania, spent many, much time here in New York, in Massachusetts. He was no longer just a Virginian. And his legacy was tied to this experiment working because what was happening after he stepped down there was no effective constitution. That's why we honor the constitution in this building. There was an Articles of Confederation that might as well have been like a UN charter. You had, you had 13 sovereign states, each with effectively total national power. They printed their own money, mm -hmm. some of them to havoc, like in Rhode Island, printing it to hyperinflation. Others not printing enough, and there was severe uh, recession. There was no national market economy. They could put barriers up between the trades so that New York was putting barriers on the money coming in, the trade coming through New York Harbor to Connecticut and New Jersey. Vermont was scheming to leave the Union altogether and join with British Canada. The frontier forts. Washington had invested heavily in the frontier, but even deeper he knew that America's future was on the frontier. And he the, also thought that because the Northwest Territories still had remnants of um, Britain and right. Spain, and there was, it was the Wild West. Right. The Northwest was the, the Wild West. That's the British had maintained their forts yeah. despite the treaty in the Northwest. Spain was pushing into the Southwest, and we had no army to defend the frontier right. because we hadn't, the Congress hadn't paid the troops right. in, in years. 
So that, that was another question, too. We, we didn't have any sort of national vehicle to there was really no demand government. taxing so that we could pay a military. But wasn't there also the thought that, well, why would a democracy need a military? We needed the military to revolt against Britain, but what does a peacetime country need with a military? Well, Wasn't Washington, the... before he stepped down, had written a document on that. If we want, if our future was in the frontier, the only way we can secure the frontier is have a military. Right. The uh, Native Americans had, ever since the proclamation of, of 1763, basically controlled everything west of the, of the Appalachians. Mm -hmm. So if he wanted to have progressive settlement of the Northwest, as he wished, um, you had to be able to have a military to push the Native Americans back. You also needed to move the British out of the front forts in the f Northwest and push Spain out of the Southwest. They were conspiring to regain America. Washington became convinced that, I mean, he was worried that in some states people were losing their freedom because majority faction in states like Pennsylvania to an extent, certainly Rhode Island, where you had a single house legislature and no effective governor or judiciary, that a majority faction was imposing tyranny, taking away the liberty from others. So he was worried about that. Right. He was worried about a lack of a national market economy because people couldn't trade across boundaries. Right. And he thought for America to have prosperity, we need a national market economy. But he was also afraid that we would lose our very independence right. because as this chaos would descend, and think of all the revolutions that end in chaos. The French Revolution later, all the, so many of the revolutions in the Arab Spring right now. He saw that happening in America. So did others. So did Robert Morris and Governor Morris here in Pennsylvania. So did John Jay in New York. Other people up around. They began communicating and they said, we have to pull this nation together. We need a constitution that makes one nation out of 13 sovereign states. And that became their call, and they realized that the only person who could pull this off was Washington. If he cared about his legacy, there would be no legacy if independence was lost. If the country broke up, he'd just be, and the revolution would just be an asteroid in history, a footnote in history, it wouldn't really matter. Right. And so to preserve his legacy, he was literally pulled out of retirement. Well, he was pulled out, but he, he was pretty active, especially when you said he believed in the canaling of the country, like that we needed yeah. these canals to connect the East and the West, and he was sort of proceeding with that without any you know, national mandate to do it, but he had to get permission from, from two states, I think, to do that. But he realized that from a pragmatic yeah. sense, the way that the country would prosper would be if you could increase trade, you had to do that with the canal, so he thought, let's just build a canal. And um, so yeah. he did that, and it failed, but it showed vision, and people still rallied behind him, but so was that a pivotal moment for him too to realize that we can't even do these big infrastructures that we need unless we are united? You're a little too, it didn't fail. It's just the Erie Canal was better. <laughs> so that, oh, that succeeded more than it his succeeded canal. More. Okay. His actually made money and did, did operate. Um, but yes, he, he, shortly after his retirement, yeah. he took a trip west. He had invested before the Revolutionary War in the frontier. So he had large tracts of land in western Pennsylvania mm -hmm. um, and in what's now West Virginia in the Ohio Valley. He went out to check on those. And when he got across the mountains, he was really scared by what he saw. Um, first, the frontiersmen were, as he later said, were on a pivot. They couldn't trade across the mountains, so they had to trade either down through the Mississippi, which meant through Spanish New Orleans, or up through British Canada. Those countries were conspiring to reacquire those, and Washington was convinced that they're going to flip. There's no, they have no alliance to the East Coast. Um, also, they wouldn't pay him. He got out, and there were squatters on his land, and they said, who are you? And they wouldn't pay him. And he couldn't even get to his largest holdings because the Native Americans had moved in, and he was warned, they're waiting to ambush you and hold you for ransom. We can't control that territory. There's no troops to protect you if you go down to your furthest territory. So he couldn't even go there. And he came back saying, we're going to lose the West. And he said one way, you mentioned the, the canaling, the Potomac navigation system. It wasn't really a canal. It was a deepening of the existing river. And, and he became convinced, we've got to be able to get their goods to market. And the closest way to get the goods to market from that area, from the Ohio Valley, is a is a, is a navigation system across the Potomac. And so 
he becomes deeply engaged with that. He has to negotiate it. They have to get both Pennsylvania and uh, Maryland, as well as Virginia, to approve because it crosses those state lines. That in itself was trouble. That's why he insisted on interstate commerce powers in the Constitution um, he had by personal experience. And he is able to t start the project. And so he starts a navigation project that he is engaged in until he becomes president. He becomes president of that navigation project to link up the West with the East. And it represents his view of enlightened government. He said, this is in the national interest. And he raised funds. He, it was a private company. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a chartered private company. He raised funds for it. And he said, this is a great investment. This is in your best interest. And it's also in the best interest of the country because it links us together. And he always believed that people operate out of their own self-interest. And so his goal as a leader was to try to align the individual self-interest with the public self-interest. And that's the way it worked. He wasn't a starry-eyed idealist. He was a pragmatic working politician. Right. And he, um, so, so the fact that, I mean, people have said that he had such self-interest in, in these projects that, it's, that he was operating only from self-interest. But you're saying that it was a pragmatic balance of the two, which I think then becomes reflected then in the Constitution. It's always this tension between self-interest, national interest, the right. self-interest of the state, the interests of the, of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like how capitalism works. Uh -huh. The idea, the theory that it works, unless the, as long as it's true free trade, mm -hmm. the idea is that individual self-interest will ally with the general interest and right. the, the invisible hand. And Washington had that view. He, said, he even said about his soldiers, he says, these soldiers won't fight unless they believe it is in their self-interest. They're not going to go out and die and risk their lives just for some abstract cause. But that self-interest is they believe that with a new republic, we will be, that they will have better opportunity and their children and their families will have better opportunity, that it will be a better government. And, so you, and they would follow him because they trusted him. Mm -hmm. And they trusted him because he was a realist. He said, he would be honest with them. This is in your self-interest. If we do it right, this is in our self-interest. And same way with the Canal Project or the Constitution. He would always defend it on this grounds, that by a national government, as opposed to these squabbling states, by a national government, and only by that, and he repeated this so often in so many letters and such, and everything he was saying during this entire period, what we need is we need respect abroad. Our country has to have respect abroad so they don't have these retaliatory tariffs and destroy our economy. We have to have, we want prosperity at home and we need expansion westward. And we can only get those with a new constitution. Right. So, so bring us up to date then, um, the very tortured letters back and forth between Washington and oh. others. Should he attend the constitutional convention? Should he not? And one point that you make is that he said he did not want to attend something unless it was going to be a success. But the more he thought about it, he realized it would not be a success unless he attended. And so it, it, he had this conflict within himself. Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay in Mount Vernon, but realized that the credibility that he could bring to the Constitution could actually even draw people to come. Because the, <laughs> the prior one, they, right. you know, they couldn't get a quorum. So how yeah. do you get people from 13 states to come? And this was not in a time, obviously, when you had trains. I mean, these were people who had to all get to Philadelphia. And, and he, he was the draw. And so his very presence led credibility to that. Could you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about about that back and forth, the letters, and yeah. what his concerns were about whether he should come or go. The country, come would, or stay, rather. the central government was so weak that they had, they, that all 13 states had not been even represented in Congress since 1776. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and they could ra rarely get a quorum in Congress. And so the fear was they'd had the Annapolis Convention where they tried to get some economic um, reform for the conf uh, Articles of Confederation, as you point out, and they couldn't get, they could get only a few states to come. And so they knew that the, the leaders of this, the people pushing it, and Washington, of course, was one of the people pushing it, knew that Washington, he was truly, along with Ben Franklin, who was quite elderly at the time, was in his 80s, he was the one true national celebrity. He was the person, remember, he'd led a w revolution, and the soldiers came from all 
13 states, and they'd all gone back to all 13 states. So they all knew him. And so he had a national constituency. Um, and he knew that, that, this, that a stronger central government was needed. And others like Morris and Jay and the other people, Madison, um, agreed with him. But none of them had the stature to pull it off besides Washington. But Washington knew it was sort of, or feared that it was a one-shot deal. He had credibility. But if he, had, if he went, and it failed, okay. and it failed, well, he'd lose his credibility. He, he had a great sense of public opinion. He had this instinctive sense of the, he knew it was a republic, and he knew the people ruled, and he had this instinctive sense of how they would react. And if it failed, he would lose his credibility. Then there'd be no one to pull it together. So he had to be sure there was a, a government that would work. Now, there was no, there was no precedent, Congress, the old Confederation Congress was a one-house legislature um, that people, that half the members didn't even attend. There was no president. There were no courts. Um, it had no binding authority. It couldn't tax. It couldn't, couldn't do anything that imposed on the people. It had to work through the states. Now, he had to have an idea of a new reform. He often wrote, we need a, he'd actually write this in his letters, we need a revolution in government. We need radical cures. Those were his own statements. And so what he did, before he agreed to come, right. he wrote letters to the people he trusted most, to John Jay, to Henry Knox, who was head of the War Secretary at the time, mm -hmm. um, uh, to James Madison, asking them, well, what sort of government should we have? And they all sent him letters. And he read those over. And then he personally compiled them into a single document that really is the basis of the Virginia plan and the basis of the Constitution, that com compilation. He was struck with how similar. And then he became convinced there is a plan here. There is an alternative government, a two-house legislature, an independent president, executive, checks and balances, uh, a Supreme Court and inferior courts. Those were all in this this compilation that he put together mm -hmm. and brought with him from Mount Vernon to the, to the Constitutional Convention. But once he was convinced there was a possible plan, right. and once he was convinced that the states would not so limit their delegates that they would be limited to just revising the Articles of Confederation because he thought the Articles of Confederation were beyond revision, mm -hmm. he, once he became convinced of that, it was like Hamlet, and by the way, George Washington loved plays. He loved, the thing he liked about coming to Philadelphia is you had a lot of theaters, and he was happiest watching a play, and he loved Shakespeare. And so it was, should I go, shouldn't I go? If it's not gonna work, I can't go. He had to become convinced that there was an effective plan, mm -hmm. and that, these, that this, this Continental, this Confederate Congress, this mm -hmm. Constitutional Convention would say, as he put it, say, to the depths, the problems of the Article of Corporation and offer radical cures. And once he became convinced of that, if his health held out and his mother let him go, he, he went. It's funny you should bring that up. George Washington's mother actually did not want him to go. Can you tell us about it? It's very funny. She always, she was, he was her boy. She was the second wife of her husband and George Washington was oldest son. And they had a very, very tense relationship. Mary Washington lived until he was president. So he lived that long. And she was constantly badgering him. Um, she didn't want him to, it, her first thing is he wanted to go off and be a British Navy, work, go in the British Navy. You can't go, you can't go. She stopped that. Then, he, then when the revolution came, he wanted to go off and be uh, he, he, he offered his services to go off and be, of course, commander in chief. She didn't want him to do that. She constantly complained, this fight's none of your business. Stay out of it. Stay home with me. I need a son who'll take care of me. Um, when he, she married Martha, when he married Martha, she so objected she wouldn't come to the wedding. And she never <laughs> again, she never again visited in Mount Vernon. Even that had been her husband's home that she inherited. She never came back because she couldn't tolerate Martha. So there was this <laughs> constant tension, and she would, oh, and she would get sick at the last moment. You've got to come to me, son. And she didn't want him to go to Philadelphia. I'm going to die while you're in Philadelphia. So he had to go and visit her, found out she wasn't that sick. And then the same <laughs> way when he became president, you're leaving me. She wanted a dutiful son right. more than a national hero. <laughs> Doesn't every mother. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not a dutiful son. <laughs>
Though um, she constantly asked him for money, and he grudgingly paid, kept complaining, if you watch your finances, you won't need any more money. But yeah. she constantly was asking for more. What can I say? I think that's... Um, some of what I really enjoyed about the book is that you have those de details. The fact that the most, probably the most famous man in the world may not have attended the Constitutional Convention because his mother was, was <laughs> saying, you know, I'm really sick. He goes to see her and she's not so sick after all. And it's thinking, I, it just, it was very funny. And it, and it just made the book so much, um, it just made it very, very real. It was, it was great. Well, can you describe to us then, he comes to Philadelphia. Um, his, his comportment was just beautiful. I mean, he, he was sort of this neutral moderator, yet everyone knew he was a nationalist, so just by the way he voted, they sort of knew which side he was on, but he very much stayed out of it, and yet had this, um, he lent credibility, but he also had this aura of um, getting it done. And you said that he stayed in some of the finer rooming houses, but he didn't take his meals there. He would go to the taverns, where everyone mixed and mingled, and it sounds like, the discussions did not break down along demographic lines the way you would think, like they weren't divided by region or by, um, by other uh, personal prejudices. I mean, it seemed like there was this concentration on relationship building to try to suss this stuff out. Um, if you could talk about that and then a little bit about how no one spoke, the secrecy around it, which I find amazing, because right now I'm sure people are tweeting here and no one could tweet during the Constitutional Convention. Um, if you could just paint that yeah. aura. Well, <laughs> Washington at the Constitutional Convention personified what Jeff was saying before. Jeff said that this, what makes the National Constitution Center special, is it brings people together across ideological lines and partisan lines so they can talk. Right. And that's what Washington did at the Constitutional Convention. That convention was uh, a train wreck waiting to happen. And it was George Washington that held it together. It's often said that James Madison is the architect of the Constitution. Well, if James Madison was the architect of the Constitution, I contend that George Washington was the general contractor. And any of you who have ever built a house know <laughs> that the architect has a plan, but the general contractor sort of makes it work. And that's what Washington did. And he did it partly by his comportment. J John Adams, who was always jealous of everyone, including George Washington, um, later said that George Washington was the best political actor he had ever seen. And we forget that about George Washington. We make him like a wax figure sitting up there or, a, or on Mount Rushmore. But actually, he was, a, he was a great retail politician. He wasn't a great public speaker because his teeth weren't very good. But, um, but he was a great retail politician. He talked with people. And the whole time he was in Philadelphia, he stayed in Robert Morris's home, which allegedly was the finest home. And, in, um, in Philadelphia, and he could have dined there every day, but he wanted to continue to work with the delegates. The delegates were crammed into the taverns and, and inns, uh, Mary Daly's Inn, the other inns here in Philadelphia, and they would eat, tended to eat in club at the various, um, <clears throat> various taverns and, and inns here in, um, in Philadelphia. Washington would go with them on difficult days he would go and eat with the delegates and talk with them. Indeed, the most, my favorite is the day that they, the convention almost broke down over the nature of the executive because um, Randolph and Mason were insisting on a three-member executive like the old triumvirate of ancient Rome because they thought giving too much power to one person will lead to a monarchy and a tyranny. And that night, Washington goes and eats with the delegates and talks with them, the man who would be that king. And the next day, the states vote seven to three for a unitary executive, and they never look back. They trusted Washington. So he was involved. He was brokering the compromises. He was working on the compromises. And he was voting. He didn't speak because as a, a presiding officer in those days, just like the Speaker of the House today, he doesn't speak during the debate. So he couldn't engage in the regular give and take. But he always voted. He always voted, and you can trace his votes, you can follow his votes, and you can see how they put together. Indeed, his vote was so important that his own state ends up splitting. His five-member five delegation splits after George Wythe has to go home because his wife's dying. And two of them vote against the Constitution. Washington cashed the deciding vote in Virginia so that Virginia approved 
We're not talking about ratification now. We're approving it here in Philadelphia. Virginia, Washington's vote was needed that and so many times for Virginia's vote. So we can follow his position. So could the other delegates. He was also talking with them at night, often at these dinners. There were also high society teas often in Philadelphia, hosted by the ladies of Philadelphia. And Washington was always, he was the lion of the season. He was the honored guest. And he circulated widely in those. And in those settings, he helped broker across ideological lines, pulling people together, broker this convention. That's why I call him the general contractor of the Constitution. Mm. You, you talked about the ladies' teas oh, um, yes. in, in your book, and yeah. that there, there were some very uh, influential women at the time. Do you think that they, did they exert any influence on, on the proceedings? Well, what was their part in this, do you think? Well, we don't know because of that secrecy rule that you yeah. mentioned, that they voted on the opening day to close the proceedings, and of course, famously, the, the windows were shuttered, the, the doors were closed, and no one was allowed in except the delegates. Uh, and the, it never got out to the press, um, which is amazing, and it speaks to the honor of these people that yeah. even though the press was badgering for news. Um, but these ladies' teas were one place where they could talk socially. And Elizabeth Powell, uh, uh, Mary Bingham, uh, uh, Mary Morris were incredible hostesses. And they sort of modeled their, their teas after the salons in France. Mm -hmm. um, they would have these teas in the early evening and people could talk and converse, and they could circulate. And Washington very much enjoyed these teas. He went to them two, three, four times a week during the, during the um, convention. So he was a regular fixture. Um, and he was a great conversationalist, even though he, couldn't, he wasn't a public speaker. One-on-one, -on -one, he was a tremendous conversationalist. He told stories about the war. He, he'd, he'd, uh, he, he was a, people really liked to talk to him. He was both a man's man and a ladies' man in the sense that he loved to dance. And so they had a lot of balls, and he would dance, and they all wanted to dance with him. And he would make the circle. He would dance with every lady. Uh, and in those settings, the women who tended to be associated with very powerful, wealthy conservative husbands. They had been, their, their, one, you know, their husbands had been the mayor before, they'd been colonial officers, and they set a tone that seems to have shaped, they were very supportive of Washington, they were supportive of a strong presidency, and the sorts of things that they cared about ends up playing out into a national market economy, um, a powerful nation that could break down state t tariff barriers. That's what their husbands cared about. Their, one of their husbands becomes the first treasurer of the United States. One of them becomes a senator. Well, two of them become senators. They become very much, um, they're very much tied in with the social society. This is an elite society. Philadelphia was one of the richest cities in America and a very influential one. I, I think our, so there's no city that has had a greater influence on American history than Philadelphia, and this is one period where it truly predominated. It, it really comes across in the book. It made me very, very proud to live here and to be from here. Um, so when, when Washington was here for the convention, he was still concerned with matters back home in Mount, Mount Vernon. And I know yeah, you, you, you described um, his trip to Bartram's Garden, since we're all from Philly here, we know it well. Can you tell us about that and what, what he oh, found sure, there and what? Sure. Washington, it wasn't just there. He had, they had Sundays off, one day off a week. They worked six days a week at the convention. They actually, and they had a couple breaks when they had to do some, some drafting matters, uh, when everybody got to go except the committee working. And so on those occasions, he often went out, not just to Barkroom Gardens, but we'll get to that, but uh, to the farm areas around, because he was a, a planter, a farmer, and he loved farming. He was very good. He was a scientific farmer. He, he kept introducing new ideas like crop rotation and fertilizing techniques. He opened the largest distillery in America um, because he could get, and it was the greatest investment he ever made for a payoff so he could turn his grain right into alcohol and sell. So he was always inventing and dealing with new things, and he had enough money um, 
to, to, to try them out. And so he would go around and talk to the farmers around Philadelphia. He was very impressed with the farmers and the new techniques that were coming in here. And his favorite place was Bartram's Gardens. He had visited it once um, during the revolutionary period, early in the revolutionary period. Um, and then when he had a chance, he made a beeline back out there. He, he, he um, of course, knew all the, there were, there were two or three brothers and the father. Um, but he got to know William Bartram, and then William Bartram later wrote a book, a famous book about his travels, but he couldn't get it published, and so Washington actually later would put up the money to publish the first edition of, of Bartram's travels. But when he was... And just a, to explain for the audience, oh. Bart Bartram's garden, um, if you could explain what it was that he... It's a, that, Bartram, that they collected. Bartram specimen. had been the botanist to the king. Uh, he was so good. He was this natural knack, the older Bartram, had this natural knack. Billy Bartram, as he was known, this natural knack of, of collecting uh, plants. And so he would go up and down the coast and find new plants and then bring them to Philadelphia at Bartram's Gardens and plant them and cultivate them and then had a catalog and sold them in Europe. And indeed, the only reason the Flanconia tree survived was he found it in South Carolina, brought it back, cultivated it, and then it was never found again. Um, and people grow Franconian trees. He named it, of course, for Benjamin Franklin, um, his good friend. And so um, this was a famous garden, famous already in Europe, where they would grow crops. This up, I think it was up on the Schuylkill River. Um, and he would, uh, and so Washington knew about it, and he went up. And then after the convention, he made a large order um, of, of products from there. Um, he took back the catalog, and they shipped down quite a variety of plants that he planted then at Mount Vernon. So this was a clearinghouse for American plants, quite a remarkable institution, truly known. Um, they, had a, they sold plants in Germany and France and England. It was an impressive place, and it was right here, thanks to the Bartrams, and then it's the, uh, John Bartram, who was the older Bartram, and then it's taken over by John Jr. and Billy, or William Bartram, who then writes this, who on one of the trips down collecting plants later, comes back and writes this incredible book, Travels. If you've never read Travels by William Bartram, it is a wonderful read. Wow. And so I, I think the fact that his trip's there and he was really consumed with it, it really shows that he was still thinking that he may go back home to Mount Vernon. And he oh. may go back home and still be a farmer. And although thinking I could be president, he had this constant pull, obviously, toward Mount, Mount Vernon. And one point Absolutely. that you make, too, is that he had just as tortured a decision about whether or not to be president. It was just as tortured as whether he should come to the convention. And one of the concerns he had was that when he retired, um, he didn't know if it would be seen as an appearance of impropriety if he were to come out of retirement when he said he was leaving, and if that wouldn't make, it, make him look wily in a way that he had never intended. And um, mm -hmm. so he, he was sort of this, this reluctant figure and this pull of Mount Vernon all the time. Could you talk a little bit about the process it took? And I realize that we don't have a whole lot of time yeah. here, and there's questions I'll, from the audience, I'll I believe, to be too. Brief. But maybe just yeah. a little bit about, yes. about that, that pull. And you spoke also about his legacy and mm -hmm. how he was childless and perhaps was waiting for his own different kind of a legacy. He, he could he, do all that in five minutes. Though. I'll try. <laughs> He loved his plantation. He, as I said, he was a scientific farmer who was very interested in farming. Uh, but the plantation and his investments were his livelihood. Right. I mean, they were his source of stability, of wealth, of income. He never took pay. He took his expenses, but he never took pay as a general. He never took pay as president. His income came from his plantation. And no one else could manage it right. He was a... It was like his mother. Um, <laughs> no one else could manage his farm right. Um, it was a difficult because the, far, the soil had pretty well played out, and he shifted from tobacco farming to wheat farming, mm -hmm. um, which was a good move. Um, but so he constantly had to nurture this place. And he'd turn it over to people when he wasn't there, and inevitably it was not, it, was not, it, it wasn't just the lush place that could automatically produce wealth. And he, with him micromanaging, it could make money. And so he wanted to be there for that reason. He loved it back there. It's beautiful back there. Um, his wife never wanted to come back. She didn't want to come back. She wouldn't even go to his inaugural. She stayed, and she, didn't, she wanted to be Mount Vernon. Um, but so, yes, there was a constant pullback. 
But he realized that his legacy, which he cared about tremendously, because he had no children, his legacy was the country. And if the country could do without him, he was much happier, because his legacy was secure from the revolution. But then he came back, and what my book covers is his tremendous involvement in forging this union. Then he would prefer not to be president, but he realizes he has to be it at first. But even then, even when he took the oath of office, he didn't really hope he wouldn't have to stay the, even the first full term, and that he could step down, because his tradition, his established legacy was leaving, was, was leaving it in other hands. That's a Cincinnatius model. But it turns out he has to serve that whole first term, and then he had put together a diverse cabinet. That was his trademark bring a variety of ideas together. So they talk, Doris Card Goodwin talks about Lincoln's team of rivals. Well, the first team of rivals, whatever she's got, Hamilton, Jefferson in the same cabinet, throw in Knox and Randolph, there's the team of rivals, the best men. And that's the way he liked to lead. He liked to pull these people on. And all sides, Jefferson and Hamilton, said, you have to serve again. It's not done. So he agrees to a second term. They're all trying to get him to do a third. And he says, no, if you can't make it on your own by now, I think you can. I'm out of here. Um, and you bring up that that was one of the problems. People could picture, all right, we can have a president because it's Washington. What are we going to do when he's done? Right. And, so, and so the question becomes, how do we set up a system so that yes. we don't always need George Washington? And he thought that if he stepped down and still here, when that, when that first transition occurred, he, by being a citizen of this country, could be a resource and help make this transition work. And he tried to serve as a resource for John Adams, but um, it was a difficult presidency, and it takes Jefferson finally. Uh, that's that's going to lead us right into our other oh. questions, because the audience has some, some great questions, one that you and I had spoken about beforehand. Um, someone asked, did Washington take a strong position on slavery? If so, what was it? And if you could explain how mm -hmm. you reckon that with, you say he was a man of character, but he also owned 300, at least 300 slaves. Well, he owned uh, about 125, but his, but wife, his wife came to the somebody. wedding. Uh, his wife, of course, was married before and had children from the earlier marriage. They never had any children themselves. Um, and she brought, she was with, she, it was a good marriage financially. Um, she brought, even, even though his mother didn't like it, she brought many more slaves to the, to the plantation. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult issue. I'm so pleased that this institution has this, uh, downstairs has this wonderful exhibit on Jefferson and, and slavery. Um, it's not quite as bad as Jefferson's situation, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's hard to understand when we look back how these people who could believe what they did, how, how Jefferson could write, all men are created equal, how Washington could do what he did and still own slaves. And the only way I can reconcile it is Washington was a man of his times. He had been, he had grown up with slavery. His parents had slavery. All of his peers in Virginia had slaves. There was slavery everywhere in the world. There was slavery in European countries. There was slavery in Africa. There was slavery in China. There was, as he grew up, there was slavery in all the colonies. There was slavery in South America. There was slavery everywhere. Now, to their credit, some of the people, and it's really the first time that it really happens, some of the people in the revolutionary period in the Americas begin turning against slavery. But when you think about it, Every single person who signed the Declaration of Independence except John Adams owned slaves. Didn't matter what state they were from. Had owned slaves at one time. Let me be precise on that. Some people moved beyond it. Ben Franklin, to his endless credit, at his incredibly elderly age, mm -hmm. becomes the head of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. Now that's a man who sees the future, and Ben Franklin is amazing. But during the Revolutionary War, some of Washington's aides, in particular Lafayette and Henry Lawrence, and to a lesser extent Andrew Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, start speaking to him on this slavery issue. How can you own slaves? You would send a great model by abolishing, by ending your own slave holding. And Washington debates that. It's clear. He debates it. He begins saying slavery is not a good institution. It doesn't really work well. But he is so committed to the union 
and he knows that this union won't hold together because the South is economically committed to slavery. And he has owned plantation in his own works. And then when he starts doing that navigation project, he buys more slaves for the navigation project. The company used slaves to build it because they couldn't get free men to do this miserable job of building the... And da dangerous, too. Dangerous, oh, yeah, because they were, they were blowing, this, blowing up the river. And people would be blown up at the same time. Um, it was difficult work because the, you know, the explosives weren't quite so good back then. Um, and so he, grew, so he was actually relying more on slaves, and he, yet he wanted. And so how he deals with that, it's interesting. On his deathbed, he had written two wills. And we don't know what one said. But he, on his deathbed, he says, this is the will. He tears up the one, and this is the will. And that will provides for the freeing his slaves. Now, Washington is always more an actor than a speaker, and I have to believe that he was trying to send a message with that final act of toward calling on people to free their slaves. But it was a, he obviously continued to have his slaves, and it, it, we have to say he was, a, he was a product of his time. I can't excuse him because we do see people like Benjamin Franklin making the change. But of course, for Ben Franklin, there wasn't a financial incentive. He didn't need slaves in his printing work. Um, Washington, it's the only way his plantation can operate. And so despite the urgings of people like um, Lafayette, um, he doesn't free his slaves until his deathbed. Right. OK. Um, here's another terrific question. Would Washington be surprised at the role that corporations play today with regard to the power to the people? What do you think? Back then, they didn't have corporations like, like we have today. Back then, people thought, um, people thought that everyone should pay their debts. And corporations are an institution designed by gentlemen to determine how much they pay their debts. Um, because, of course, they, uh, you know, they have limited liability. Um, but Washington, um, Washington, when he goes on this Potomac navigation project, mm -hmm. he won't go into it unless the states charter a company. And you could only back then charter a company for public, public interest. So a toll road, a, a canal, okay. navigation system, a bridge. And he insists on having a corporation and have the money go into a corporation. So he used corporations. But of course, he would have had no notion of what corporations would become. When you think about that, how they're playing, Washington, actually, the one thing that makes him um, so different than, than Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton, who form political parties. Washington really hated partisan politics. He hated that discord. That's why he put a diverse viewpoint into his cabinet. His final, of course, his farewell address, he warns America against having political parties. He truly believed that elected officials should be elected by the people, and he knew there were tough campaigns because he fought tough campaigns to be elected to the House of Burgesses. Um, he would provide alcohol to a lot of voters in return for their votes. He knew how campaigns worked, but he thought once you were elected, you should use your own judgment and during your term and not be linked in partisan politics. And so not only with corporations, but with how the whole system is working today, I think that's the thing that he would find most difficult. He didn't anticipate the rise of the two-party system. Right, OK. Uh, here's one. Washington voluntarily stepped down after two hmm. terms. Should senators and, con and, congressional <laughs> and congressional representatives have those limits today, and would it benefit our country today? <laughs> um, I think we have our answer. Uh, I, I, I have my own thoughts. As for Washington's thoughts, he did believe that people should return to the citizenry. Now, whether he'd set specific terms, he himself served two terms. Uh, he did have this sense, especially with Congress, that Congress should be um, going back to the people regularly. And of course, that's one reason there were two term, two year terms, mm -hmm. short terms, constantly um, elected for what they thought would be small districts mm -hmm. where they thought people would know it. Actually, oddly enough, that was the original idea of the Electoral College. They actually thought they would for the Electoral College. The idea was, well, we know Washington's going to be elected because everybody knows him, but how are we going to have the second president? Because nobody, you know, nobody knows this. There, we didn't have a national media. So the idea was is to have these electors elected in small districts um, where people could know the elector. 
and then the elector would then get together in their states and they couldn't just vote for somebody from their state. They had to cast one of their votes for somebody from another state. And the idea was that the people would know the electors, the electors, and the first electors were an impressive group. The, the top men of Virginia, like George Wythe, served as an as elector. So um, the electors would then use their independent judgment. And that was the idea of the way to keep this office close to the people and how you could choose a second and a third president without a national media, because they didn't anticipate that they would be running on party tickets. Right. But by 1800, as I write about in one of my other books, the on the election of 1800, we have become two political parties who were putting together, putting forward figures, and people weren't voting for the individual, they were voting for the party. Wow, okay. Great, great points. These are, these are terrific questions. Um, yes. This is great. And I, this Honest actually, questions, too. Yeah. Um, during the interview, you discussed the correspondence of Washington. Mm -hmm. It is known that Martha Washington burned most of the personal correspondence. Correct. In your research, were you able to uncover any information pertaining to the relationship during this time period, and if she helped convince him to attend the convention? Well, quite the contrary. She didn't want him to go. She didn't want him she to go. She was trying to convince him against going very, very strenuously. Um, and she didn't go even though she usually went with him like in, during the military service, she would come up every winter mm -hmm. and spend the winter with him. And she liked Philadelphia. She had friends there. She didn't go to the convention. She stayed back home. That's why he had time to go to all these teas and balls and, <laughs> and uh, out to the tavern all the time. Um, he liked Porter, by the way, in addition to uh, um, his famous love of wine. He also liked Porter, and that was at the taverns. But, um, no, it is difficult. She does destroy these personal letters. So we don't have, like, the wonderful letters between John and Abigail Adams sure. and their relationship. So we don't have that. There's an enormous body of other correspondence because when everybody received a letter from George Washington, they never gave it up. They loved because George Washington was a celebrity. But she didn't want him to go. She didn't want him to become president. She had her grandchildren who, because her son had died and she was raising the grandchildren, um, and they, she wanted to stay at the... Uh, the, the farm, as it were, at Mount Vernon with the grandchildren. Uh, but Washington was called away. Uh, so we know that. As for the rest of her personal relationship, yeah, we can get a pretty good feel from it, from the diary, from their activities together. They, 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 they ate together. They, 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 they had a very good, solid relationship. It suspects that it wasn't romantic, mm -hmm. highly romantic in the sense of Jefferson's with his first with his only wife, um, and with um, Abigail and, yeah. and John, who had tremendously close romantic relationships. It was more, uh, um, it was more formal, and it, but they were very devoted to each other, mm -hmm. and they knew each other very well. And, but you know, just to see them must have been a sight, because he was huge for his day. Yeah over 6'2", and built like an oak tree, you know, with these wide hips. And she was under five feet. She was very, very small. Wow. And so, um, but she was, a, she was a wonderful hostess at Mount Vernon, and they had a very, very close, sort of working, solid relationship. Wow. This next question kind of builds on that. Um, why did Washington never write a book? He wrote tremendous letters, but he never wrote a book. Is this, is this true? I didn't he know. Never, he never wrote a book. Uh, that's correct. He wrote, uh, I don't think he ever thought about writing a book. I mean, not when you think about that, not many of them did write books. Um, he, was a, he wrote letters constantly. Of course, they didn't have you know, telephones and telegraphs and everything back then. And so he was constantly writing letters back and forth. And we have a tremendous volume of his correspondence. And he was a, he was a little bit of a flowery writer, but he was a good writer. He expressed his mind, uh -huh. he, but he was a terrible speller. John Adams used to say, oh, the guy can't <laughs> spell. How can he be president? He can't spell. He was a bad speller. He didn't, he didn't have a, a handle on that. And he loved to read books especially loved, I mean, Don Quixote was probably his favorite. He loved to read. But he, I don't think the thought ever crossed his mind to write a book. I've, uh, he, 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 he wasn't a philosopher. He, 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 wasn't a, he wasn't a collector of information like Notes of Virginia. Uh, he was a practical farmer. I guess he did write articles about farming, though, <laughs> that, were about, that, that he sent off to English farm journals. Right. He had a lot. Well, so tell, tell us a little bit. You, you stayed at Mount Vernon. Is that right? 
Yes. And you were there for quite a while. What, what was that like for you? And also, when I, I know when I've spoken with other authors, they talk about how writing the book has changed them. Has writing this book changed you? And what was it like being at Mount Vernon while you researched? Well, when I got into it, it did change me. Because when I got into it, I didn't know how deeply involved Washington had been mm. um, during this period in the politics, how deeply involved he was in ratification, how deeply involved he was in the first federal election to make sure that Federalists won that first federal election and not anti-Federalists to take over the Congress, and how deeply involved was thinking about the Constitution before he went. Um, the, I'd gotten into the book because um, I wondered what happened to Washington during this in-between time. We hear all about him at the Revolution, and we hear all about him later, and I wanted to find out what happened to that period. But being at Mount Vernon was one of the great blessings. When I, when I started this project, there was no Fred W. Smith Library, and there wasn't a chance to be there. I didn't even know they were building one. They were, but I didn't know it. Uh -huh. And then in my last year, um, as I was finishing the writing, they opened this library, and I get a, um, get a call, do you want to apply to be the f one of the first inaugural fellows and live on the grounds? And yes. because Washington was there in that time, and because he loved the land, and because Mount Vernon reflects him in the so same way that Monticello reflects Jefferson, being there and being able to walk the grounds, it was so great before the tourists come, and there are hordes of tourists, there are school groups walking through, there are tourists everywhere, to be able to walk around, to go out and sit on the front and watch the sunrise up, um, uh, over the Potomac in the morning like he would watch it, and then be reading his letters, because he talked about, and his diary, because he talked about the place all the time, and then in the evening to be walking around in the farm, in the areas where, he, where they've recreated, or go out to the distillery and help them make the whiskey, which they still do. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not very good. <laughs> um, it made them a lot of money, and it's making them money, but... In a um, pinch. But uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, not even a pinch. Um, but anyway, the chance to be there helped enrich... You said you liked the stories, and it, it helped enliven and gives me a feel for what he was living. Yeah, wonderful. Um, one perhaps last question, I think. Are, how are we doing on time, anyway? I think this might be the last one. Um, actually, I'll save the other one for last. This is, you mentioned in the beginning about the parallels between <clears throat> Washington's legacy and the current world crises. Can you explain? Sure. I mean, we, Washington's legacy, um, the, why this place is famous is why the Constitution is important. It's really America's second revolution in a way. Washington called it that. Um, we needed to secure our independence, sure. But look at the world revolutions. Today, we're having them all the time. And some of them lead to tyrannies as bad as the tyranny that they overthrew. Others lead to prolonged chaos. We're seeing that today. We've seen it for the last 200 years. Because Washington stepped down, we avoided the tyranny. But we got the chaos. We were getting the chaos. And because he came back in, and not just him, but Ben Franklin and others, and because of what happened here at the Constitutional Convention, we ended up with a document that could establish broad representative rule and made the first revolution work. And that's what makes, that's why it's relevant to today. What we need in these countries and how can we create it is a lo local leaders like a Franklin, like a Washington, like a Madison, who make these countries that had given a chance by throwing, overthrowing tyranny to make it work. And it's proved to be an endless problem that we're, we're suffering through right now in the Middle East and other places. Now, there are places where it works. I shouldn't be too pessimistic. Look at Czechoslovakia. Havel there made a country that's working. And Poland, they, there, these were revolutions there too. And they had great leaders. And those leaders make a difference. Think of Nelson Mandela in, in South Africa. Think of what could have happened without Nelson Mandela. Right. So things really can turn on one very pivotal and important person. Leaders, make, not, a yeah, leaders make a difference. One yeah. with Washington, but it took, of course, more than one. He, but he was one of a group. Uh -huh. But people can make a difference, even though it's a popular movement. He realized it's a popular movement. I'm not dis, I'm not, it, it takes the people, we the people. But it also takes leaders, and leaders can make a difference. Right. And then the final question we should get, get to answer, how, how has the book affected you or changed you? It took a lot of research. It covered important things. And it deepened my appreciation of the, uh, of the value of the reforms that came about. It also showed me that these are real people. Yeah. 
And, there, and politics matters. They were deeply engaged in politics. So in that sense, it deepened my appreciation and understanding of the legacy that we try to carry forward. And I suppose as much as anything, that's the way the book has affected me. I think it's a great story. I was privileged to be able to tell it. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope I, in some small way, did it justice. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time here today. Thank really you so appreciate much. it. Thank you.